Hello, it's Keith here, and this is lesson four of the platform specific series of my 8086 programming tutorials. Now, we've been looking at DOS systems, CJ, EGA, VJ in the past. We're going to do something a bit odd this time that might surprise some people. We're going to be looking at the Wondus One. You see, the Wondus One was 186 compatible, so the um, processor is basically the same as your 8086 DOS machine. That means we can make our example we looked at in the past work on the Wondus One if we wish. Now, it's not a bitmap screen, it's a tile sprite based system and what we're going to do today is we're going to define our character as a sequence of tiles and then we're going to set those tiles visible on the screen to show our character and that's how we also show our font. The Wonder Swan itself started off life as a black and white machine and then it was upgraded to color and so there's not too much difference between the black and white functionality and the color functionality so we're going to actually use both today in the example. The example is going to be able to compile to both systems as we wish. Okay let's go over to today's source code let's see it in action. So we're using the same hello world example as every other time here and let's fire it up here and let's just select Wonderswan WSW here. Here is our graphic. The character looks a little bit weird because the colors haven't really transferred but um, you can see it does run. And then if I run again for Wonderswan color, well here you go. Now the character is in full color glory and the character does look exactly the same as it's supposed to. Now, if you want to export a bitmap graphic for today's example, you can use my AcroSprite editor. It's free and open source. Here it is. And if we go to the 8086 menu, Wonderswan, we've got various options here for the system. So you can export as a 4-bit per pixel or a 2-bit per pixel, and you can use planar or linear format. Okay. Now we're going to go over what those mean in just a moment, but um, first of all, let's have a look at the common code here. So screen init will turn our screen on. We're going to go over that. Uh, this is not related to today's example. That's for the bitmap screens. It's this Wonderswan code here that we're going to be looking at. So what we're doing here is we are transferring the bitmap data from our cartridge, which is just here, into the pattern data for the tiles. So that's what this define tiles function does. Now we're writing to tile 128 onwards, the first 96 of our font, you see. We need a font in there somewhere. So we're, we're using that. And then we're using this fill area with tiles. Now what actually happens if we just look at this graphic here and we turn on the grid, is this is split into eight by eight chunks and these are transferred as individual tiles. And then those tiles are represented on screen so that our character is shown. So this is actually broken up into eight by eight chunks as well. And that fill area with tiles will start from an XY position and work with a width and a height and a starting tile number and it will fill them sequentially as a grid and that gets our character nice and easily on the screen. It's a little bit easier than working with sprites for a beginner so that's what I tend to do. And then we're defining our palette. Like last time we're using a common palette format and we're converting it where appropriate. Now this only applies on the Wonderswan color. It will have no effect on the regular Wonderswan. The palette works slightly differently on that system. And here we're loading in values into DX here from the palette definition and AX will select the palette entry we want to change and the Windows one is a 16 color system effectively. Okay, let's have a look at the Windows one code then and let's see what's going on. So here's the Windows one specific code here. We've got the screen initialization here. First we're turning off the layers here and then we are just defining the mode for the Windows one or the Windows one color. Here's the Windows one color version. Here's the regular Wonderswan version. Now we have to define whether the bitmap data is going to be in linear format, and that's where a 16 color graphic will use one nibble, or a planar format where there's bit planes, and that's where all the bit zeros for a single eight pixel strip are in a single byte, and then all the bit ones, then all the bit twos, and all the bit threes are separate in four bytes. So um, we're selecting planar mode in this case, and that means we have to make sure we export in the same format when we go to our menu here and select Wonderswan. You've got linear and planar options here. It doesn't really matter which you use, you just have to be consistent really. So here we're selecting the color mode here for the Wonderswan color. Here we're selecting black and white mode for the regular Wonderswan and we out that to 60H to select our screen mode. We're transferring the font here. We're not going to cover that today. It's effectively just the converting a one bit per pixel font. It's not really anything particularly exciting. The more important thing though is our definition of our initial palette here. Now we're going to look at the Wonderswan color palettes in just a moment, but the Wonderswan black and white palettes work slightly differently. Um, the color palettes, we can define each color channel separately. We effectively define eight colors. And you can see we do that here. We've got one nibble basically per color and we're just defining these as 
eight shades of gray here and then we need to select four of those to make up our palette and that's what's happening here so these two parts together will define the colors that make up our character here so for example if i just um, change this if i just close down the previous example if i alternate and select the eight colors in the opposite order here and i compile again well now you can see the colors are inverted so that's just a very simple palette being defined there but it, i think it makes it clear how we can select different colors and just effectively in this case just flip the colors over now as well as the default eight colors there we also need to select the background color and and we're doing that here and this is only used by the transparent areas um, once we've defined the colors for the black and white system we're clearing the tile map just to setting all the tiles to zero here the tile map starts at hexadecimal 1000 in ram and it's 32 tiles wide and 32 tiles tall now in this case we're storing words because each tile uses two bytes so we're just clearing that all out there and then we're resetting the scroll position so that the top corner is the first tile in the tile map just to make things nice and easy for us we're then having to define the memory addresses for the tile map you shouldn't need to change these then we're actually turning on the tile map layered screen we're just turning that on so we can actually see the results and then on the wonderswan color we're enabling high contrast mode although to be honest i don't know if this makes any difference on the emulators but i think this was something that does work on some of the real hardware unfortunately i can't test this on the real hardware i don't have any hardware to do that but that will turn on our colors there so once we get to this point we've finally turned on our screen now you remember there was some information regarding the Wonderswan color palette there now we're actually redefining that palette anyway which is why I skipped over that when we want to set the Wonderswan color palette effectively what we need to do is we need to write this to memory address FE00 and onwards now there were two bytes per color within this memory address so the mem color we want to change here we're multiplying by two by shifting to the left by one and then we're just shifting the bits around in the correct format for the, that address now we're using green red blue format in one nibble per channel the wonder swan color uses one color per channel as well but it uses red green blue and the top nibble and use the same as our format so all i'm doing here is i'm just shifting some of the bits around and then writing those to that memory address just there so this function is a quite easy way of both setting a color by specifying ax as the color number and dx as the grb color format if you preferred of course you could convert this to red green blue and that's what's actually happening during an initialization here all we're doing is we are just bulk copying a default wonderswan palette in native wonderswan format here just as an initialization so that if we don't define our own later we'll at least be able to see what's going on so that's what happened there okay so that's how we're actually turning on the screen and getting things set up when it comes to defining the tiles that will make up our characters graphic and of course the font as well we need to write them to the correct memory address now the original Sw wonder swan just used two bits per pixel and it used tile patterns at memory address hexadecimal 2000 the wonder swan color used four bits per pixel 16 colors and that's at memory address 4000 so depending on the system we need to write to a different address also depending on the system we need to write a different amount of data so that's going to be quite important now what we're doing here is we are specifying our destination address here we're specifying segment zero the ram area for our data and then we're going to shift the tile number by four or five bits to effectively multiply it by the number of bytes per tile and we're just adding that to the off the destination here and then we're starting our transfer and we're transferring all of the bytes of our bitmap data and if we just look here where is it there it is we are effectively calculating the number of bytes to transfer just here by using the bitmap test start and the bitmap test end here to calculate the amount of data to transfer so so irrespective of the number of bytes it's actually the size of the file we're transferring the file in entirety here into the video RAM. so this has defined the patterns that we have the potential to use on our screen as as i said before the second stage of that is to actually show them to the screen you see if we disable this fillet with tiles function and run well we got no graphic and equally if i don't define the tiles but i fill the area well we know we've now got a little black area and if i change the tile number from 128 to zero for example well now you can see we've filled the area with our font 
because we've used the wrong tiles altogether. So this fill area with tiles function is defining the visible tile at certain positions in the tile map position BHBL with CHCL as tiles AX onwards. So that's what we're doing here. So if we have a look at that function, that will be the last part of our routine. Now, our tile map base is the same irrespective of Wonderswan or Wonderswan color. It's hexadecimal 1000, and each tile is used in two bytes to define it. The format is effectively nine bits for the tile number, four bits for the palette, and then there's a Wonderswan color bank and a horizontal and vertical flip. So we've got various options here, but it's only the tile number we're interested in in this really simple example. Now, the tile map is 32 tiles wide, so we're taking the wide position and we're effectively multiplying by 32 by effectively shifting to the left by six bits here. And that's effectively multiplying by 64. That's 32 columns, two bytes per column there. And that will calculate our Y position. We're shifting the X position by one bit because we need to multiply that by two. Remember, two bytes per tile. And we're adding all of that together in our destination. And this will effectively work out the memory address we need to write to within bank zero, the RAM bank. Now, what we do next is we are just moving AX into that calculated destination here. We were moving a word because remember it's two bytes per tile. We're then incrementing AX here and we are then ready to repeat again for the next line. So this is doing one line of tiles. At the end of the line, we're calculating the start position of the next tile. And so that will do the next line below it and the next line below it and so on. But AX is going up consecutively each time so that the tile map is redrawn. Of course, the important thing is that the pattern data of our character is split up in the same order as the visual routine. If the routine went down the screen and our exporter went across the screen, then it wouldn't work. So it's important that this is outputting in the same format, breaking up the tiles in the same way that this routine is expecting it. And of course, that's why I wrote my own sprite editor that exports and I wrote my own example that uses that sprite editor's export. But that's really all there is to it, to getting tiles onto the screen. Now this is working with a grid of course, but if you wanted to work with single tiles you can do that as well. I've got a print char routine that's doing a very similar thing to print characters to the screen using the tile map and you know anything else you wanted as well. Now, of course, the Wonders One Color can do sprites. You know, that's something um, we're going to cover later on, probably. But um, for today, I just wanted to give you a very basic introduction to getting some simple graphics onto the screen. And hopefully this will be enough to get you started. So there we go. That's how we can get graphics to the screen, at least basically speaking. So that example will work on the Wonder Swan or the Wonder Swan Color. And I think it's a bit of fun to see the 8086 doing something a bit different other than MS-DOS all the time. Anyway, I hope you found this interesting. I think the Wonder Swan's fascinating and hopefully you'll give it a go because it's one of these systems that failed uh, that deserved more credit than it probably got. But anyway, whatever you do, I hope you enjoyed watching. If you did, please like and subscribe. Liking my videos helps tell YouTube that they should recommend them to other people. So maybe other people will find them as well if you do. But whatever you do, I hope you enjoy your programming and I wish you all the success with the creative projects you're doing. Thanks for watching today and goodbye.